the Lord, church, can give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. It's worthy. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've done this with like a bunch of people. Usually it's just Thomas and Nicholas and, and Dwayne. So thankfully my nerves haven't kicked in uh, just yet. And you know, Pastor, if I go longer than what the kids, you know, before they come back, don't forgive me if I'm shorter than that. Uh, I'm used to timing it for 30 minutes. I'm not used to timing it for however long they're up there. Uh, but today we're going to be uh, on uh, lesson four in the lesson plan, which is the lesson saved. Our uh, focus thought is, we are saved by God's spirit and God's grace. The focus verse is Titus 3 and 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Lesson text is Titus 3, 4 through 8. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable, unto me and you may be seated a uh, book starts off with a story if you you guys read the lesson uh, about a man named stanley walker he comes from a uh, an english family and he was living in chicago at the time and it's a story about how there's sometimes we don't realize how rich that we truly are <clears throat> and so stanley he was one of two sons uh born to a wealthy shipbuilder in england and the his dad passed away in the 1950s and when he passed away, he left his fortune to be split amongst his two sons. And that was $8 million at that time. If you plug in an inflation calculator, it's about $90 million in today's currency. And so Stanley was now a millionaire that his dad had passed away and left him that inheritance. But he was not living the life that a millionaire, we would typically think, would live. He wasn't staying in five-star hotels. He wasn't living it up with members you know, of high society. They sent a search party out, the estate did, to try to find him, to let him know that his inheritance was coming to him and how much money that he had. And in the process of trying to track him down, they got a lead on him and said he'd been sleeping off his drunkenness in cheap hotels and on street corners. Not really the life you think of someone who just became a millionaire. When they finally caught up with him, it was too late, he was already dead. He was found dead sleeping in a doorway on a cold autumn night in Chicago. The, they don't know the cause of death, but uh, obviously his health wasn't the greatest from the life that he lived. He was a millionaire. He was rich, yet he didn't even know any of it. He was rich, and he didn't know that he was rich. And he didn't know that he had to live constantly like he had been living. He could have changed his whole life around, but for him, it was already too late. And now it doesn't matter because, you know, now that money that was supposed to be going to him is going to someone else now. His dad had a plan for him, but because of the life he led and because of the choices that he made, that plan got blown all to pieces, and he never got to experience the riches and, and all the good things that his dad had laid up for him because he squandered his life. If one of us here today found out that, that we missed out on $45 million, I'm pretty sure every one of us would be a little bit ticked. We'd be a, a little bit livid. You know, I myself... I'd be sick, and I've probably told it before, but, you know, the cryptocurrency stuff. Years ago, my buddy told me, he said, man, invest some money. And I was like, eh, nah, it ain't going to do nothing. Today, I'd have $15 million in the bank if I'd listened to him. But, you know, if I think about it, uh, you know, oh, well, I can't do anything about it. So think about $45 million. That would make me a little bit sick. And so we walk around every day, and people, you know, one of the things they, uh, the saying is two things people want to do 
in life is they want to be rich and they want to be thin, but nobody wants to put the work in for it. And a lot of people want to be rich. A lot of people want to have the things that the world wants to offer you, but what we don't realize is that we're already truly rich. We're richer than any money or any objects that this world can truly offer. When you open up the Bible, everything that's written down in there, it already belongs to us. You know, if we're a child of God, that's already our inheritance, the mercy, the grace, the healing, the salvation, the deliverance, the, the list goes on and on and on and all of that. And God wants to just freely give it to us. He wants to say, here, I've already paid for it. This is yours. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, that's a bank account that's never going to run dry. You can swipe that mercy ATM card day after day, and it's just going to keep going. It's not going to be turned away. So the sad thing is there are people, and sometimes we ourselves walk around and we don't realize just how truly rich we are. Man will strive as hard as they can to, to obtain the riches of this world. And they get so busy chasing the almighty dollar and, the sight, uh, and they lose sight of the riches that we already have. Some of the poorest people financially are some of the richest people when it comes to spirituality. <laughs> Uh, we sing the song, you can take this whole world and give me Jesus. But how many of us really mean the words in that song? If you were offered everything in the world, you know, all the riches there, all your wildest desires, would you take that or would you say, just give me Jesus? I look at people like, like Sister Bernie, and I don't know what her financial situation was at the end of her lifetime, but I never saw her or Travis or anybody driving in in a solid gold Lamborghini. But to me... She was richer than any Elon Musk, Bill Gates, or, or Jeff Bezos. She had something better than money could buy. Because their money can take us to Mars. It, it, it can give us global internet coverage with, with satellites. It can guarantee us two-day shipping anywhere in the U.S. On, on almost anything. But it can't buy a walk with God. It can't buy an answered prayer from God. We've heard the story so many times that the pastor tells it of the boys being struck by lightning. And, you know, the pastor goes into to his closet to pray, as, as he always does. But as he goes in, the Lord talks to him, and he said, don't even worry about praying, because I've already heard Sister Vernie's prayers. Forget the money. Forget the fine things. That's what I want. I want the riches that come from God. And I want the riches that she had. I want the walk and the prayer life that she had. And I want that closeness to God to where I go to God, and he says, okay, I'm going to answer your prayer. We've got Zach Carter on the list. We've got a, a baby named Cal that's on the list. Uh, he's a friend of my nephew's. He's got a muscle disorder. He's only about one year old. We've got Morgan Pryor's granddaughter, who was the doctors say were basically live in a vegetative state because her brain never fully developed. And what if the next time we go to pray for those people, God speaks to us. He says, don't worry about it. I've heard Jonathan's prayers. I've heard Dwayne's prayers. I've heard Junior's prayers. Y'all don't have to worry about those things anymore. What, who wouldn't want that? I mean, to have that ability, that's worth more than anything in Fort Knox, and yet it doesn't even cost us a single penny. Things like that are already part of the inheritance for the children of God. And the Bible says he knows our needs before we even ask. Any request we go to give him, he already knows what we need before I even have to ask. Jesus said in John 14, 12 through 14, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you ask anything in the name of Jesus, he said, I'm going to do it. And not only the works that Jesus did, but he said, you're going to do greater works than what I did. Jesus said these signs are going to follow them. That I believe all the miracles and the signs and wonders. They were, you know, you talk to people and say, oh, that was written for people. Back then, the, the Bible is still in effect. The whole part of it is in effect for us today. All, everything that they did, it all applies to us. And those are things that we can obtain. We can get those gifts back working in the church. And we can get them. It just takes a little bit of effort on our part. Peter passed by, and just the shadow passing over people healed 
someone. Jesus cast out thousands of devils from one man. You know, the, the story of Legion, a Roman Legion had anywhere between four to 6,000 soldiers at a time given in. And when they said, uh, our name is Legion because we are so many, that man was filled with so many devils. But Jesus cast out thousands of devils and we still have that power. We can obtain those things, but we have to put effort and time into it, which sometimes we don't like to do. The other week the pastor was talking about, you know, fasting and everything, and that's, you know, we're weak because that's one of the, the hardest hit areas in our lives, but it's something that we really should be doing if we want to get the gifts and the power back in the church. And right at the scriptures that we just read there in John, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And one of these commandments that's in there is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of it will be added unto you. So the, one of the best commandments is seek after God and the rest is going to come. So don't worry about everything else. Just worry about seeking after God first. The gifts and the riches of God, that are, like I said, they're there for us. He's already paid the price and all he asks of us is to seek after him, to walk after him. And the closer you get to God, the richer that you're going to become spiritually. And so if we stop and think about the, you know, the love and the kindness of God, it can really be hard for us to kind of fathom. It can really be hard for us to, to truly try to grasp because it's an, it's an endless love. It's a love that knows no bounds. And you can think about it with your life, like you know, you're working at a company. All the times you've, you've fallen short, the mistakes that you've made, you know, after a while, if you keep messing up at a job, you know, especially if you're doing the same dumb thing over and over and over again and getting caught doing it over and over again, chances are that company is going to cut you loose pretty soon because you're holding up production. And with man, generally you only get so many chances before people write you off. But God is a little bit different. Now, I'm 30. I know I'm getting old. And, and at that time, I've made my fair share of mistakes. I know that's hard to believe, but I have made my fair share of mistakes. And I've given God plenty of reasons just to be done with me, to say, I'm writing you off. But yet, here I am today, and he still loves me continually, day after day. And the Bible says, what, what is man that you're mindful of us? Why does God continue to show us love day after day? And the, the answer is, I honestly do not know. I cannot explain why he continues to love us, but he does it anyway. And, and like I said, it, it's hard for man to grasp you know, that kind of love, and we really don't understand the why of God. So that's something we, that I don't know if we'll ever be able to understand, that why he loves us so much. But even though if we don't get it, we don't understand it, we see it manifested in so many ways. I heard a song on uh, the radio the other day. It says, no other God can be called Father. No other God can be called a friend. No other God can be called Redeemer. No other God is coming back again. And there's no one like him. There's no little G God. There's nothing in the world that can compare to the love that you're going to get from him. Like who can save you? Who can redeem you the way that God does? Who else would die for your salvation? Because I tell you, there's nobody in the world that's going to lay down their life for your salvation because man is, is somewhat selfish. But God came down and put on flesh just to die for us so that we might have salvation. There's no one or no thing, but God is the only one that cares for you and loves you that much. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 and 16 should be a familiar scripture to us. And it says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. And like I said, he came down and put on a robe of flesh for me and you to redeem us and to save us. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That day at Calvary, God truly showed his, his love and his kindness and just how great it is. And he didn't show it just to me. He showed it to all men. In John 3 and 16 it says, for God so loved the world. And it didn't say not one specific group. It didn't say for God so loved the Jews, for God so loved the Gentiles, for God so loved America, for, for any other nation. It says for God so loved the world. He loved the whole world. He loved me 
and he loved you. He loved the disciples and Judas and the people that just drove the nails in his hands, the ones that mocked him and put purple on him and put the, the crown of thorns on his head, the crowd that chanted crucify him just a few days before him. People, billions of people in this world that would live that would never serve him or even hear him. He loved them so much that he still died for all those people. And, and knowing all of our faults and knowing all the times we would continue to fail him, he still loved us enough to come and die for us. He, he knew he was the only one that could say, as we sing that, that song, you know, Jesus knew in the beginning that man would surely fall, but, you know, the blood, it covered it all. And he knew from the very beginning, from the foundation of the world, that he would have to come and do that for us. I mean, like I said, trying to wrap your head around, I mean, before he even said, let there be light, he was like, I want to have to come rescue these people. Before man walked the earth, he said, I'm going to have to rescue him because he's God. He knew everything and everything. He had a plan for everything. And he knew that only his blood could truly cleanse us. We know in the, the Old Testament, blood sacrifices were required. It was pretty much a yearly thing. And it was in order to save man, not just any lamb would work, not just any sacrifice would cut it, not just any drop of blood could wash away those sins. Hebrews 9, 12, and 15 it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. So that scripture, that says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, him, excuse me, purge your conscience from, your, from dead works to serve a living God. And 15 says, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that are under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Through his blood we obtained a redemption. We've obtained our eternal inheritance. And if the blood of bulls and the blood of goats, it, it sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more can the blood of Christ do for you? Amen. And now through him, people can receive that promise of inheritance. Christ died for us. In Isaiah, it says that, that he has borne our griefs and that he has carried our, sor our sorrow. And like sheep, we've all gone astray. We've all gone our own way. We've all gone and done what we wanted to do. And it says, the Lord laid the iniquity of all men upon him, upon that one sacrifice. All of our sins, all our problems, every time we mess up, God laid it upon him to be that sacrifice. And again, in Hebrews, it says, why they, <coughs> excuse me, it says why the shedding of blood was so important to us, and that's Hebrews 9, 22 through 26. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And that remission right there in Strong's, it means freedom or to pardon. So without the blood, there is no freedom for our lives. And he said, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, with better sacrifices than what had come in the past. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, and now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest, enter, me, high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission. In order for us to have been free there had to have been some shedding of the blood in those scriptures we straight I was talking about it said he's just not entering the regular temple he's not entering the temple that's made by man he, he's talking about a sacrifice it's something more than the day of atonement that the, the pushed all the sins back he's talking about a very special sacrifice and again there was only one person that could do it and that was Jesus Christ and I could spend all day talking about you know the goodness of God and and you know his love and everything he came down and he was beaten, and he was mocked, and he was crucified, 
all that so we could be redeemed and are we really worth it I honestly don't think the answer is yes but he looked at us and said actually I do think that they're worth suffering all this and he did it all so we could be redeemed and so we could spend eternity God loved us so much that he said I'm going to go down there and endure all this I'm going to spend 33 years on that earth so I can give them a chance to come and be in heaven with me his whole life he lived it to be a living sacrifice for us. He lived, you know, so living a holy and acceptable life, you know, in our lives is really the bare minimum that we could do to, to you know, to honor what he did for that sacrifice of what he did. And he revealed his love to us. And because he revealed it to us, now we can know his love for us. And I can ask each of you here today to, to tell me of a specific instance of where God showed his love for you or something special that God has done for you. And I'm pretty sure I could come up with a couple hundred different answers Amen. if we ask everyone. And we've experienced it in similar ways. I mean, just think about every breath that comes in and out of your body right now. God has given that to you. That is him giving you life. And just think about the privilege that you have to be in church today, the privilege that you have to know truth. God showed his love, and because he did that, you have a chance of salvation. And then again, you guys may have experienced God's love in a different way than I have, and I've probably experienced it in a different way than you, you have, because that's one of the great things about the love of God, as well as the salvation that he offers, is that it is limitless, and there's no bounds, and it's available to every single person. Galatians 3 and 28 says, there's no Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. There are no divisions, basically, what they're saying. There's no separation. No one is treated better than, and no one is treated worse than, than anyone else. And saying all of us are equal. All of us are one in Jesus. The love and salvation that God gives to everyone is universal. That you can go to the pits of the Taliban in Afghanistan, you can go down to South America, you can go to Hollybrook, wherever it is, the love of God is gonna be the same and the chance for salvation is gonna be the same. And I've told the story before, but it's just such an impactful one about the man that Brother Davis knew down in Tennessee that ended up on death row. He, he killed his grandmother and if you went ahead and read the news article about that man, it was, it was a grisly murder, he was on drugs, but he got a hold of a tape about Brother Davis preaching about the power of God. And then he turned his life around. He called him. He said, Brother, I want that power that you're talking about. And he became a model prisoner. There was a man who was disabled, and he was not getting the best care in prison. This man who murdered his own grand grandmother was now carrying this man around on his shoulders to take him, to bathe him, to feed him. There was a change made in that man's life. And then he went and started witnessing Acts 2.38, true salvation to those people. And so he knew he was going to die, and he was just ready to go meet the Lord. And because of him and his witness, and other people were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost on death row. So if God's love can reach someone on death row, I'm pretty sure it can reach anybody that's out there. And we've talked about Paul as well, how he wreaked havoc on the church, but God turned him around and look what he did. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 13, it said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You were saved by grace through faith and not by works. Now that doesn't mean there aren't works required of us that we have to do. You know, we have to repent. We have to be baptized, you know, filled with the Holy Ghost, live in a righteous life. Those are all things, those are all works that we are required to do. And one of the commandments that you'll, you'll find repeated in the Bible, it says, be holy 
for I'm holy, I think God said it seven or eight times he was trying to drill it in to the people's head. And so we're called to lead a righteous life. We're called to leave a life that's approved by God. And the more, if you want to do that, the more you follow in Jesus' footsteps, the closer that you're going to get to him. That, and the closer you get to him, the more you're going to be like him. And that's the whole point of really being a Christian is to live and to be just like Jesus. Works alone could not save us. I could do all the good deeds that I wanted to. I could be one of the best people there is in the world. But if I don't have Jesus, then those works in the end really don't profit me anything when it comes to my salvation. And my good deeds alone, like I said, won't get me in to heaven. I, I can't get there on my own. And in myself, I can't escape you know, the, the bondage of this flesh. And I can't escape the bondage of sin. Only Jesus can help you escape that bondage. Only Jesus can offer you that freedom. The Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, that he was perfect in his generation and that he walked with God. His righteous living, his good works wouldn't have been enough to save him on his own. When the rains came, he could have stood outside, he could have had a list, he could have had a tablet, listing every good thing he'd done, every righteous thing that he had done. But that he, if that's all he had and he didn't have God, then he would have ended up drowning out there just like everyone else. But his righteousness was one of the things that got God's attention. God, the Bible says he's looking to and fro throughout the, world, the, the earth to find someone that he can use. And so Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord is what saved him. It was the grace of God that helped save Noah. But him leading a righteous life is what got God's attention, having a relationship with God. So there's a pretty big correlation in the Bible that links people living righteously with people that have favor and grace with God. David said salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation when you're in trouble and also salvation when it comes to your soul. Everything goes through, all salvation goes through God. In the lesson text, Paul said we are also saved through his mercy. And I like how the, the book breaks down mercy and grace here. It says that it's helpful to view mercy as the reversal of grace or the reverse side of the card as grace. <clears throat> Where grace is the bestowing of an undeserved blessing or gift, much like salvation. Mercy, on the other hand, is a withholding of divine judgment. And God has a patient love for the lost people in the world. He has a patient love for, for everybody. And we talked about earlier how hard it is for us to kind of grasp that kind of love. And if you were lost at one point in your life, you know, before coming to church, God could have laid the hammer down to you. He could have brought down... The judgment, he could have taken you out of this world in an instant, but he didn't. And if you're like me, if you've been in this thing since day one, there's no doubt that he has showed you mercy time and time again. You know, in all my failings, God could have cut me off, you know, but yet he still decides to show me mercy. And he decides to show all of you guys mercy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he gives people chance after chance after chance. And people say God's the, the God of a second chance. And he's actually the God of another chance and another chance and another chance. I've, I've lost count on how many chances he's given me. But I tell you, I've racked them up pretty good. And even though we so often deserve his judgment, he decides to grant us mercy and he withholds that judgment because he loves us and he's patient with us. The Bible says he is long-suffering. I can tell you... Uh, him putting up with us during this, this pandemic is a testament in itself at, at how much he loves us and how great his mercy is. As I get older, I think some of those Judy Clark genes that I inherited uh, are starting to kick in. You know, I'm starting to become not a big fan of whining or complaining. You know, I'm invested in the suck it up mentality. That's a, that's a motto to live by. You know, when I was younger, I used to think, you know, you read about the, the Hebrews in the wilderness and God wanting to wipe them all out because they're murmuring and complaining. I would think, oh, God, you're the God of love and everything. That's a little bit harsh, don't you think? But, you know, listening to people over the past year as, as richly, especially as this church has been blessed and people in this country have been blessed to hear them whine and complain over a year's time, it finally clicked. And I was like, you know what, God, I finally understand why you want to wipe us all out. We deserve it from time to time. And I, and I truly get what he would want to wipe them out multiple times. I'm like, I get that now. You know, as I'm older, I'm like, you have every right to do it because I can only imagine 
how many times every day man gets on God's nerves. It's probably a constant, just a thorn in his side. And I don't know about you, but I can only handle annoyance for so long before I have to do something, before I have to leave. But God has been putting up with man for so many years, ever since Adam and Eve. And that's a special kind of love right there. And again, it shows God's grace and his mercy towards us. You know, the Bible says on the seventh day, God rested and man came on the scene. He knows you never read about him having another vacation day again <laughs> because we keep bothering him and we won't let him rest. Paul said, we're also saved by the washing of regeneration. Washing here refers to baptism, uh, to the washing away of sins. And I'll get to Acts 2.38 here in just a little bit. But baptism in Jesus' name is crucial for us to being say, if you've ever tried to, to witness to someone about baptism or if you've ever been in a debate or a discussion with someone who, who doesn't believe quite like we do, chances are baptism has come up and you may have ran into people that don't even believe that baptism is truly necessary for salvation. I remember debating with a guy one time and he said, by telling people they need to get baptized, you're putting an undue burden on them. You're putting a burden on them that they don't have to have. And I was like, I'm not the one putting anything on them. I'm not the one that's telling them to do it. I said, Jesus is the one that tells you that you have to be baptized. And John 3, 3 through 5, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus will later go on and say that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And when you read about people in the book of Acts, when they began to get saved, when they went through that salvation process, all of them had to be baptized. And when Cornelius and his, you know, they went and preached at his house, his whole family was baptized in Jesus' name. Philip and the Ethiopian, where they do, they went down to the water and they were baptized. Ananias meets Saul and he greets him and, and Saul gets his, his sight back and then Ananias looks at him and he said, why are you tearing here? Why are you standing right here? He said, arise, go and be baptized and wash away your sins. That's what baptism does. It cleanses us and it washes with the water. It, it carries all those things away and if Panda's watching this, I told him I was going to steal this one day. It was a good point. We were talking about Josiah one time, and he said, man, you know, do you ever notice about Josiah? And I was like, yeah, you know, he, you know, did all the things, broke the high places, all the altars and everything. He said, but did you read about what he did with the stuff? And I was like, well, he crushed it, and, and then he took it away. He said, do you remember where he took it away? And I had to go look it up. And so he took all the, the idols, the, the high places and everything, everything that he had crushed up, and he could have scattered it anywhere but it said he went to the brook at Kidron and he took all the sins everything that held the people back and he took all those sins the false idols everything and he put it in the brook and he let the water wash everything away so he let the water take away the sins of the people you know, at, at Pentecost that's what Peter preached that baptism was a necessity. And Paul mentioned it as part of our, our new birth salvation in Romans 6 and 4. It says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We are buried with him when we are baptized. And now that we've been buried, our old selves you know, through baptism, you know, we've buried those things. We've gotten rid of them. Now it's time to rise and to walk in the newness of life. And Titus, we read earlier that salvation comes also from the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Peter preached at Pentecost, and it pricked their hearts. You know, the people said, what shall we do after he told them, you know, Jesus Christ, that man that you crucified, he was Lord. And Christ, and it pricked them. They said, what shall we do when this is when Peter hit him with Acts 2 and 38 and 39. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. <laughs> so that's for me. That's for everybody. 
2,000 years ago, and that's for everybody that's coming until the Lord. Until that trumpet sounds, that promise is for every person. And, and spiritually, we experience death, burial, and, and resurrection through the salvation process, repentance and baptism and being infilled with the Holy Ghost. That renewal that we have, that, that breathes new life into us when we are saved and it happens when we put away the old man when we get rid of that junk that we used to do the old person that we once were and we, when we get rid of the way that we once were with that renewal we aren't exactly who we used to be we're a different person if you guys have ever been to, to men's prayer service uh, or if you haven't you, you're missing out on some good stories from time to time both brother steve's and, and brother clarence i've heard some dandies come out of them from time to time um, and so one time I, I liked hearing a story from Brother Clarence. He was talking about how he's not the man that he used to be, that he used to be just a smidge rough around the edges before he got saved. And he's talked about before, he said, people have gotten in my face now. He said, there was a time when I would have fought them. I would have beat them. But he said, now that's not in me. And then the one time I really laughed at the story, he said I, uh, there was a, you know, a cop, and he said, normally, it's the police that are chasing after you. But he said, I was the one that was chasing after the police officer. That's how the life that he used to lead. But now it's not like that anymore. As a brother Clarence, something has gotten inside of him and made a 180 degree turn. Something has changed. There's been a renewal and a rebirth in there. And like I said, we read it in Acts 2 and 39, that promise is for every person. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that sums up really the whole process. What this whole thing is about is, is when we come in Christ, when we take on Christ, that I'm forever changed. You know, my life is forever changed when I, when I become you know, I take on Christ. My life before the B.C. years, the before Christ years, those life, that doesn't matter what I used to do. Everything else, you know, people bring that up, and, and humans have a hard time, you know, forgiving the past and forgetting what people did. I've told people, you know, before the Clark motto is, well, at least I'm not the one that did this, and it don't matter if it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. People will bring it up and say, you know, in, in an argument to someone. But, you know, with God, none of that stuff matters because once we come in Christ, it's cast off as far as the east is from the west. And once it's forgiven, it's gone, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And now that Christ is in my life, when we call the AC years or the after Christ years, everything else has become new. I have a fresh start. Everything has been remade. The, the choir sings the song, uh, He Made the Difference in my life. It says, for once for the Lord. Where would I be? You know, I don't talk how I used to talk. I don't walk how I used to walk. I don't give. I don't live how I used to live. And, and why is that? Why don't you do that anymore? It's because he made the difference in our life. In the lesson text, it says that we are justified by his grace, that we are heirs in the hope of eternal life. And, and the book was spot on with a couple definitions this week. And it says our justification results from our salvation which means sinners are made right before God due to his merciful forgiveness and the transformation of the power of the gospel in our lives. Justification is just one of the pieces of the process through our transformation through Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, 5 through 7 says, To redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth his son, uh, the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son and if a son then an heir of god through christ and you guys uh if hopefully you listened to the the sunday school lesson a couple weeks ago I was talking about studying the word of god and i talked about how you have to study the word of god but you also have to study around the Word of God. you got to know the times and the places and, and all the things that, like if Paul references the three taverns and the cities he was at, you need to look up what that meant, what, why they were important to Rome and the, the Appian Way, the way that he took into Rome. You need to know what those things were and, you know, going back to the Old Testament. Um, and so it's important to understand the history behind the Bible as well. In the time that this was written, this was written, you know, in the, one of the height periods of, the, of Roman power. And so when you adopted someone in Roman society, that was a very 
very big deal. There were people who were adopted, and when they were adopted, they were made heirs to the estate. They were the ones that were going to take over. After, even if you had your own kids, you could adopt someone, and they would supersede your kids. There was actually a line of emperors. There were several of them who were adopted into the family and succeeded the person who adopted them as becoming emperor. They had no royal blood, but they were allowed to take over the empire because now they were considered an heir. They got all the rewards that came from being an heir. They, were part, they weren't really part of the original family, but because they had that name, because they were adopted, they were, uh, they were allowed to come in. And the head of the household changed their direction. They were going to live a life separately, but the head of that household came in and said, I want you a part of my family. I want you taking on my name. And with salvation, you know, we're also brought into the family, much like that when it talks about the adoption. The Bible talks about us being grafted in contrary to nature. No more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. At the, at the beginning, we talked about the riches of God and, and everything that God has for us. And there's just the splendid, amazing riches and all the stuff, the gifts that he has for us. And as an heir of God, I have access to all of those things. And if I have access to them, then I really should be using them. I shouldn't be letting them, I shouldn't squander them or let them go to waste. Excuse me. We'll come down to the wire here, Pastor. Uh, the older brother in the story of the prodigal son, he got mad. We've talked about that, that story several times over the past year and a half. He's like, why is he getting these things? He was gone. He went out and squandered everything that you gave him, all of the inheritance. He's already split his. Everything that's here should be for me. And he's saying, why, why, why? Why is he getting these things when I never had them? I never had the fatted calf or the ring or the robe. Why don't I get these things? And dad looks at him and says, you've had access to it the whole time. What's mine is thine. And I remember one time several, several years ago, this is back when I saw my trailblazer. I went out to leave one day and, and I noticed that my blazer was driving a little bit funny. And I made it to that, I think it's the Church of Christ, that, that brick church that's out in the wilderness. And I had a flat tire and I was like, man, this ain't going to be good. So everybody was gone to work. I was calling to see if someone could help me because I got to looking around and the jack wasn't in the car. I'm not saying where Nan and Papa took the jack that was in that blazer. You know, I'm not pointing any fingers. You know? So I go look around. I'm like, shoot, it ain't in here. And it wouldn't have done me any good because the spare tire, the, the mechanism had rusted underneath. I remember me and Dwayne had to pry it off with a digging bar and eventually the whole thing just sheared off. So there was no way I was getting that spare tire off. And so here I am, broke down, no cell phone signal really, and I get closer to that church and I get one bar, and I'm like, thank you, Lord, because this was several years ago before when cell phone signal was even worse. And I had enough signal to give my Uncle Tim, my wonderful Uncle Tim, a call. And I had a great idea how to get out of this jam. I knew that, that Papa had an extra blazer sitting in his front yard, and I said, I'm just gonna go over there and take a tire off of it. And so we get it off, we grab a jack, and we put it on mine, and off I go. And I tell you, it's a foolproof plan, except for one part, and that's where I forget to run it by the man who owned the blazer. And I get a call when he gets in off the road, and he says, Johnny Lee? And I was like, yeah, Papa. He said, you know anything, what's going on with my blazer? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I meant to, meant to tell you about that. And I could see why he would be curious if I, if I came home and... You know, I looked and my car was, you know, left up on a jack stand with a tire missing. I would want to ask questions. I would want to know what's going on. But not just anybody could have gotten away with that. I am me. I'm Johnny Lee. I am an heir to the kingdom. I had the keys to his building. I had blessing to use all the tools and everything that I needed to get. I'm, everything that I needed to get out of that sticky situation that I was in, it was right there in front of me. And I had access to it. So as, as heirs of God, we should be like that as well. God is saying, here's everything. I've given you access to everything. Why aren't you using it? You should be using it. From healing to salvation, God's saying, I've already given it to you. I have purchased this. It is here. It's just sitting around waiting for you to use. And, and if we don't use it, we're really squandering it. I know at school we had some, some computers that needed to be installed and some of the teachers were happy with the way that their their old computers worked. They're like, I don't want to change. I'm like, well this is no longer supported. You need to upgrade to this. And they're like, 
But I kind of like it this way. I'm like, look, we have the computers right here. They're going to be squandered if you don't use them. Trust me, you're going to like it. And people have been happy since. You know, you don't want to squander anything. The money's already been spent. You know, it's already been purchased. So why not yeah, use it? And so when, when talking about using it, we should use it in full effect, especially when it comes to our salvation. Um, he, like I said, he's already paid the price. He's already done the work. Maybe as the pastor, Dwayne said, he's already put down the down payment on us. You know, he paid that price. You know, we don't have to worry. The serving God cost us zero dollars. It cost us not a single thing. And all we have to do, all that he asks us to do is follow his directions. All he wants us to do is follow after the word of God and do what it says to do. And by the mercy and the grace and the love of God, we have hope for eternal life. Amen. Death was yet another battle that Jesus had to fight. Death was a battle that Jesus had to overcome. And so he won that for us. He got the keys. And now that's something we don't have to worry about. That's not a fight that we have to worry about, but it's something that we get to enjoy the rewards from the fight that he's already won for us. And there are so many battles and so many things that he overcame that we don't have to face now and that we can enjoy all the benefits from. We have a hope that's far beyond this world. And I hope your hope today isn't in this world, that it's on what's after this. Paul said, if I have hope in Christ, uh, you know, just in this world alone, I am of all men most miserable. If all I have in this life is Christ in this world, that's a pretty, pretty sad life. I, I don't know how things, you know, could get any worse, but thankfully we have a hope that's far after this world. And our hope today, like I said, it, it shouldn't be in this world. Our hope should be for what comes after this world. You know, I want to focus on, on what happens after this life. And thanks to the grace of God, we have a chance at eternal life. And wow, perfect time. The kids just came back there. So now it's on each of us to live a holy and acceptable life under God so that we can all receive our full reward. So God, he came down and he, he hung on the cross for us. He sacrificed himself for us. So to be worthy of that, we should live a holy and acceptable life. Because again, that's, that is our reasonable service. That is the least that we could do. Pastor.
are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood? In that praise God. blood of the Lamb. And all your garments spotless, but they white as though a prayer. Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, oh, sit Glory, glory, sing hallelujah, since I lay my burden down, oh, I feel better, so much better, since I lay my burden down, yes, I feel better, so much better since I lay praise God oh glory glory sing hallelujah oh since I lay my burden down oh glory glory sing hallelujah since I lay Yeah. 
Lord a clap offering of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. difficult, lots of changes over the past few years, but it's still the same God, <clears throat> we're still saving, serving the same Savior, it's still the same name of Jesus we're worshiping, it's still the same name of Jesus we got to be baptized in, and I thank God so much, so much for all the things that we may have changed in our world, the one thing that has never changed is God, that we can always look to Him as the author and the finisher of our faith, and this thing is about to drive me crazy. Testing one, two. I think I like this better. Y'all just give me a second. Take that off there, Thomas. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. <clears throat> Thank God so much. It was, uh, you know, we had the wedding last week, and uh, everybody kept asking me, you know, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And I just kept putting it off saying, you know, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm I'm not thinking about it. I'll, my, my, my response was that I'm Scarlett O'Hara. I'm thinking about it tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow. But when it comes to salvation, that's not something that we can put off till tomorrow. That's something we need to be thinking about today because we're not guaranteed the next day. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next few minutes of our lives. And as Brenda was talking about, <clears throat> there's the young lady, or um, Adrian, I'm sorry, was talking about her boss's uh, niece, I believe, it was thirty some, you know, thirty some years old, and now she's stricken with cancer. You know, that's something that I, I thank God that I have faith that I don't have to worry about, I don't have to believe in. I know that God has watched over us as a church, as a body of believers, as a group, and I thank God that we don't have to worry about that. Thank God so much. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you uh, could turn to Daniel chapter one. <clears throat> I haven't had to sing and then preach before in a long time. So, and Jonathan has, you know, you know, the pastor used to always talk about after Sunday school, you know, he'd say, well, Dwayne's preached on my message. Well, I can say that Jonathan has hit all over several things he has said, has hit all over my message for today. But I think that's a good thing because that means God is trying to Knock on our hearts just a little bit. God is trying to wake us up into some things. And if and me and Jonathan didn't compare any notes. We haven't talked this week about, hey, Jonathan, what are you talking about? I think I'll talk about the same thing. That wouldn't, make, that wouldn't really make much sense. But I think that's God trying to tell us something in these days, in these hours. And, you know, if you believe the Bible, you have to see the things that's going on, uh, what's going on around us and all the uncertainty with Israel and all the other things that's going on. It could be at any moment. I mean, it only takes a few things. There's some things that's got to happen, but it wouldn't take long for those things to happen and the Lord would come back. He, that's right. He said he'd do a work so fast. If you didn't believe it, if you didn't see it with your own eyes, you wouldn't believe it. And I, look in the last year and three, four months in our, in our country and the things that's happened in the world. Go to Lowe's and go find a lawnmower. <laughs> Go to Larry J. and see what kind of a new truck or something. Go to Cole Chevrolet and look at their parking lot. I mean, man thinks that they're in control. You know, man, we like to think. But look, you, you go, go rent a new vehicle. Go look for a used vehicle. Look at all these things that all of a sudden have just dried up. And we think, oh, that's no big deal. It's going to come back. We don't know that. We don't know what's going on. You look at buildings there in Miami that you never... Th you're living in a building one day and all of a sudden you're lying asleep and it falls out from underneath you? That's how quick our lives can change in just a snap. You're laying in bed and all of a sudden the, the building falls down? People... God's... Oh, you know, we need to wake up. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And then Daniel 1, chapter 1, verse 15, 
And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. And then Romans, if you have your Bibles, I'll give you a minute to get there. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Thank you, Thomas. I see you're watching me struggle with a bottle of water. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. As jo Brother Jonathan, again, Brother Jonathan talked about this, and, and, and I didn't tell him what my scriptures were, and I, he didn't, I didn't know what he was doing. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is just your reason. That's, that's the bare minimum. That's just that's reasonable. That's, you know, you go, me and Larry J, we sit down and we talk about a vehicle, and, and he gives me a price, and I tell him, nope, that's not what I want. And then we go back and forth about something, and then we come out to the re that's reasonable. You know, I want him to make a little money. Uh, I, I want to save a little money, but we have to come to a place where that's re This is our reasonable service. God, God, our, our reasonable service to God is that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Not to what you think and not what to the pastor thinks. And it's what God says. It's what comes from the word of God. That's where it becomes acceptable. By. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove, that you may test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Pastor, if you would pray, I'd like to preach just for a few moments this, evening, this morning on a living sacrifice. Pastor. Give him a clap offering of praise if you love him this morning. Give him a clap offering of praise. Give him some worship. Let him know how good he was to you this week. Let him know that you appreciate him for what he done this week. God, we thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let him know it. Tell him this morning. Don't just assume that he knows. Let him know what you, that you appreciate him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And you may be seated. Daniel, the, the first chapter of Daniel is a very familiar story. It should be for all of us. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar comes to Judah, and, you know, we've talked about it. He comes and he carries some of the best and the brightest of all the people away. Uh, the sins and the rebellion of, of Judah has just built and built and built. And, you know, we talked about it. You know, God just, just, just kept on shoveling it on top of it. And finally it, it got to a head and God was beginning to punish them. And, and the princes and the people of the king's seed, it said, were taken. The enemy took the people that had no blemishes. He took the people that were well favored. Uh, the people that were wise and had understanding in, in lots of different areas they took. And of those people that were carried away, we are very familiar about four that are written in the book of Daniel. We had Daniel, and then we had Hananiah, which was Shadrach, and then we had Mishael, which was Meshach, and then we had Azariah, which was Abed Abednego, and those were the first names were their Hebrew names, and then the second names were the names that the Chaldeans had given them. And we also have Daniel, who was Belshazzar, and so we know these as who? Daniel and the Three Hebrew children, don't we? We know them as they, they always say the three Hebrew children. And we think of these three besides Daniel as boys. We think of them as young people, but there's nothing in the Bible that says that there was anything that distinguished anything between their ages. Matter of fact, verse 17 says, uh, if you bring up Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, it said, as for these four children, that's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all four of them, it said, these four children, get, uh, uh, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. Uh, Daniel had understanding and visions and dreams. He was a little bit different than the other ones. They all had wisdom and, and knowledge and skill but he had the understanding of visions and dreams. So Daniel was not an elder spokesman. He was, he was an equal. 
He was just like the three. If they were 13 years old, they were all 13, 14. They were all just children. He was a classmate. He was a friend. He was someone, again, of the, the same age. And we get this thinking that sometimes when we read it, we think of Daniel being this elder spokesman, and we had these three. But there was nothing, and so there's no difference in them. So the king decides he wants to take all those that were carried away, and they're going to begin to teach them the ways of the Chaldeans and teach them about math and science and, and teach them uh, uh, everything that they can try to cram in these brains and and that's why it's uh schools and things you got to be careful what your kids are watching in school or, or learning in schools and what they're seeing on tv because young minds are so impressionable there's so much junk in the world and when they see this is accepted and that's accepted then all of a sudden it becomes accepted and then the next generation accepts more and the next generation accepts more and and not everything the world accepts god accepts god doesn't accept everything we we may say it's politically correct we can't say this and we can't say that and we can't come out against this and can't come out against but God does God does God don't change he's the same yesterday he's the same today he is the same forever but they had these young minds and they were beginning to impress upon them and he appointed them the Bible said that he appointed them a portion of the king's meat and wine to nourish them while they were there and they were getting the very best that was there was in the kingdom but it said that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the meat that came from the very same meat that came from the same, very same kitchen that the king was eating. The, the meat that the king could have eat ended up on Daniel's plate. It was right there. It could have been the king's. It could have went to him. It was the exact same thing that, you know, I, I probably never get to eat the same food that a president or a senator or a king or something like that. I'm just going to eat whatever Brenda fixes probably, or whatever I fix myself, but that's what's going to happen. I'm not going to get the same kind of food, but Daniel had this, and so what was the big deal about the meat? What's so big deal about the meat? Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 8, he said, if you go into a city and they received you, such things that they set before you, eat. Eat those things. Paul repeated those things in 1 Corinthians 10 and 27. If someone's not a believer, ask you to eat. He said, eat whatever they set before you, asking no questions for your conscience sake. Don't worry about it. Just, just eat it. Trust the Lord and say a prayer over it. Eat it and trust God. That's what they were saying. Don't worry about what the meat was that you were eating. But Daniel hadn't heard this preaching. Daniel hadn't heard this teaching. And he knew what the law was. And he had purposed in his heart... I'm not going to defile my body for the Lord. I am not going to defile myself for the Lord. He was going to adhere to the law even while he was in Babylon. They had changed the place that he had lived. They had changed his name again from Daniel to Belshazzar, which meant Bel is the keeper of secrets. And they were trying to change his learning. They were trying to change his language, but they couldn't change his faithfulness to God. He had determined in his heart, you're not going to change me. You're not going to change from what I believe in God. You're not going to change my faithfulness. You're not going to change how I feel. You're not going to change God in my mind. You're not going to change the way I have de dedicated my life to God. He was going to keep some things sacred so he could remember who God was, who God was to him. You better keep some things sacred in your life today. You better keep some things separated. You better keep some things that are sacred. He was going to make sure that he didn't lose his values. He was going to make sure he didn't lose his morals. He was not going to lose the standards. He was not going to lose the standards by which he lived his life. Because the, you folks know the slippery slope. Once you start changing, when's the change in? Once you start allowing something to happen, when do you change it? When do you slow it down? When do you stop it? Okay, it's right here, or it's right here, or it's right here, or, or whatever it is. Where do you stop at? When you say this, this is long or this is short, where, where do you set that limit at? Where do you, where do you, where do you put that at? Because God is the one that sets that. That's not up to us. That don't come from me. That don't come from anybody else on this earth. Some things only come from God. He determined his, I'm not losing my values. I'm not losing my morals. I'm not losing the standards. When in Babylon, make sure you don't take up her sins. That's what Matthew Henry said. When you're in Babylon, don't pick them up. In other words, while you're out hanging in, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. When you're out in the world, don't pick up the junk. <laughs> when you're out in the world, don't pick up the junk because there's got to be something that distinguishes you between the world 
and who you're supposed to serve. There's got to be something that distinguishes you between a child of God and being a child of the world. There has to be something to distinguish you, or else you just look like everybody else. Retain your godliness. Retain your righteousness. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, or who you're doing it in front of, even if it's a king. Even if you're, de- even if you're doing it in front of an entire... Retain your righteousness. Retain your godliness, because the moment that you let it go, it's gone. And it's hard to get it back. It's hard to get it back. The moment that you let it go... But if you'll hold on to it, God will bless you. God will bless you. Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had brought favor, had brought, had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And you know why? Because he had favor with God. Because he said, I'm not bending. I'm not, bow- not going to change. Here, I am not defiling myself with the things of the world, I'm not going to pick those things up. I'm going, to keep, I'm going to maintain my standards, my standard of living with God. And because he had done that, God had given him favor. He had purposed in himself, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. I'm not going to do this. And we may feel like that we have to work the hardest in this world, and, and we have to dress the best, and we got to show up early for work, and we got to stay late to impress bosses and whoever else. But real favor comes from God. Real favor comes, that's where the real, I know we like to think that, that I can go show up early and I can work hard and I can give 115% and the man's going to take notice of me and that's going to be good. No, that don't mean nothing. What it means is you got to, it, it, favor comes from the Lord. And if God favors you, God will put you in favor with ever who he wants you to be in favor with. If you'll purpose in your heart, God, I'm not going to defile you. I'm not going to defile myself with the things of this world. God will give you favor with whomever he wants you to have favor with. And that may not be the boss at work, because that may not matter to God. God may not matter whether you got favor at work or not. God matters about favor with people that you can have influence with. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And when he does give you that favor, favor, whenever he gives you favor with whoever it might be, you better praise him for it. You better worship him for it. You better thank him for it because just like I was saying right when we got up here, you better thank God for the things he's done for you because he don't have to do it. God don't have to do it. God does not. He's died for us. There's not anything else that he really has to do. The rest of it's on us. So he said the man that this man that was over these young men became to Daniel. And so Daniel said, I'm not going to eat this, this meat. And, and so he began to uh, get on Daniel. Dude, you've got to eat this meat. You've got to eat the meat and you've got to drink the wine. He said, if the king finds out that I've allowed you to do whatever you wanted to, and the king expects you to look like everybody else, and he looks at you and you're faring because you're not eating the meat and you're not drinking the wine and you look p- fair, you look poor and you look thinner and you're not looking as strong and as healthy as these other people he said i'm afraid for my head (laughs) he knew what the king was going to do he would take his head out uh, his head off but daniel reassures him he lets him know he said give us 10 days give me 10 days give us 10 days let us eat pulse which was herbs and vegetables let's eat pulse and let us drink water let's let us be vegetarians we want to be vegetarians that's what you know you can't defile the vegetables from there let us be vegetarians and then after these 10 days when you come and you examine us and then you decide for yourself he didn't say look and see if we're fair he said you just look at us and you decide as you see us you you deal with us whatever you see whatever you see in our lives however what <laughs> let it, let me let let me not defile myself with the lord let me live my life for god and then you Look at the people that live for God and are faithful to God and are faithful consistently every day and day out. And look at the people that flip-flop around on the end one minute and out the next minute. And you decide yourself. You be the judge of that. You be the judge. The steward said, okay, I'll do that. Daniel chapter 1 and 15 says, and at the end of the 10 days, their, con- the, their countenances fair, appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Because the nourishment didn't come from the meat, it came from the Lord. <laughs> it didn't, the nourishment, man shall not live by what? But by what? 
every word that cometh out that come proceeds out of the mouth of God. Proverbs 3, 1 through 8, just paraphrasing it, they'll put it up there for it says, My son, forget not my law. Let your heart keep my commandments. It'll lengthen your days, it'll give you life, it'll give you peace. He said, bind mercy, bind truth around your neck. He said, write them down, write these things down in your heart. He said, then when you do this, you'll find favor, good favor. You'll find favor and good understanding with God. And you'll find favor and good, and good understanding with man. He said, trust the Lord. Don't lean under your understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. Fear the Lord. Depart evil. And this is what gives health to your navel. This is what gives health to your body. This is what gives marrow, the strength, and the nourishment to your bones. We don't need the king's meat. I can go outside and eat the grass. I can eat the gravel. I can eat the dirt. And if I got God, I'll have nourishment. I don't need the king's meat. I don't need what the world has to give me. All I need is God in my life. And whatever, if I, des if I decided to eat the piece of paper... God can change that into the four food. Y'all don't believe that God can change us into the four food groups right now? He created the heavens and the earth. You don't think that I can't eat this? I can, I, I'm not going to. But if I needed to, you don't think that God can't nourish me on that piece of paper? He created the heavens and the earth, didn't he, Brother Clarence? He's done bigger things than that. He's done a lot of things that man never would have thought he could have done. They didn't need that. And we could save a lot more money on our groceries and, our, and, our, and our, on our these medicines that we have to think we have to take off. If we would just trust God. If we would believe these words. If we would not lean into our own understanding that i got to have this blood pressure medicine. I'm talking to Dwayne here, so don't, don't, you know, don't think I'm getting on you because this is Dwayne. i got to have this blood pressure medicine and i got to have all this other stuff or else I'll... No, if I would just trust God and I would not lean into my understanding, I would lean into his understanding, he would give me the health, he would put the marrow, he would take care of everything that there is. If we really believe, if we give our lives over him completely and we'd, he would bless us this way. Daniel said, you judge for yourself and the world. Let the world see the difference that's in you. God blessed Daniel, but when he blessed Daniel, he didn't just bless Daniel. He blessed the, four, the other three young men that was with him. It said that Daniel had purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile his body by eating the king's meat. But then we just read just at the beginning, it said, after 10 days, it said, their countenances appeared fair. Daniel wasn't alone in just doing this. There was three other that had jumped in and said, hey, Daniel, you're going to do it? We're going to do it too. We see you, Daniel. He wasn't the elder spokesman. He wasn't the leader. He wasn't, you know, us following the pastor. He wasn't the shepherd. He was a friend. He was a comrade. He was a, a classmate. He was a, a playground buddy. But the playground buddies saw him and said, hey, we see that Daniel's doing this. And if Daniel could do this, well, we can do this too. Two, they purposed in their hearts, we're going to do the same thing that Daniel did. We're not going to defile ourselves either. Daniel had decided he was going to stand for what was faithful, and it was enough to inspire the other three. Daniel had decided in, in, his, in his heart and his mind, I am not defiling myself with the king's meat. And because he did this, it inspired the other three young boys that was with him. You don't have to preach a sermon to, to inspire people. You don't have to go out and hound out tracks to live the gospel, to show the gospel to people. You don't got to do this stuff. All you got to do is live it right in front of them. All you got to do, you don't have to go to church and bring a Bible or go to work and bring a Bible and thump people on the head with it. Actually, you'll drive them off. The biggest thing that you can do is live a consistent life every day, day in and day out, and let them see God bless you. And then allow them to say, let them be the judge of it. <laughs> let them be, give, a, give, give me a couple of days of, of not defiling myself with the word, by, and studying the word and living for God. And you be the judge of it. You look at whose life and who's got peace and who's got joy and who's got happiness and who's got, it ain't about money. Brother Jonathan just said that some of the richest folks, some of the poorest people in the world, or some of the richest when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to a close walk with God. You don't need stuff. You don't need money. All I need is God. If I got God, I'll eat the piece of paper, and God will take care of me if I have to, Brother Jerry. All you got to do is live it in front of him. All you have to do is stand 
for what's right when all the world's flipping upside down around you. All they have to do is see you give, you, you give your life to him, and he'll make sure that people see it. God will make sure. They'll see the change, and they'll see the difference, and they'll see the blessings that come around with it. Would these three have stood if Daniel had not? We don't know, probably. But we know that they did when he did. <laughs> when he stood, they stood. And we do know that they saw his example. And when they saw that example, they joined in. And that's what being a Christian is all about. Being Christ-like, seeing what Jesus is like, and jumping in on board with him. And then hoping that everybody else sees it, and they jump in board. It's about on board with that. Again, living it day in, day out, one day at a time, every day of the week. Allowing those that are around you to see the love of Christ that's in you. To see the victory that comes with living for him. To see the peace and to see the joy and to see what comes along with being a a child of God. And not just a child of God, but someone that has wholly dedicated their lives to God in everything that they go to do. To see that it's possible to stand up right in the middle of this whole storm. No matter what went on for the last year, two years, five years, whatever it might else it might be. That no matter what come along, no matter what the news says, no matter what happens, and I can't go buy another new vehicle, I'm still going to stand for the Lord. If I can't go buy another lawnmower, I'm still going to stand for the Lord. If I can't go to the grocery store and get meats and vegetables, I'm still going to stand for the Lord. Because he can sustain me. When nothing in the world can. He can sustain me when nothing else in the world. They need to see somebody that has, their, has Jesus as their rock. That when the storm is blowing, that their feet's not on sinking sand, but it's on the rock. And as it's blowing, they're not, why is that person not, why are they not worried? Why are they not moving? What in the world's wrong with them? It's because there's something that's down inside of you that you have decided, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to defile myself with the world. And I know when I don't defile myself with the world that Jesus God is standing with me. They don't want to see somebody that's rolling in with the tide one day they're in and the next day they're out. One minute they're in and the next day they're out. One day they're in church, the next day they're not, they're not there. One day they're saying, they're, I'll never wear this again and I'll never listen to this and I'll never ever watch this and I'm not cutting this and the next day they are they that that's not the consistency that's not the what the world wants to see because you one day oh I'm I'm living this way and I'm I'm going to live this way and I'm going to do this and then a year later you ain't what you used to say you were I'm never, never. They need somebody that's going to give not just 10% or 20% or 50%, but it's just going to give the Lord everything. That's just going to say, no matter what happens, no matter what comes against me, I am going to stand. And when you do that, they need to see people, someone that, whose life and their attitude and their actions and their language and the way they dress and everything that goes along with it doesn't change with every cur- whatever their current situation is. What, as the situation changes, so does the way they live, so does the way they act, so does the way they talk, the way they dress, the way everything that they go to do, it stays consistent day in and day out. Because to be a real life of the Lord, you don't need to be burning one minute and out the next time. You don't need to be one day it's off and one day it's on. You're going to be a light, it's not going to be flickering and then dimming and then flickering and dimming. You want to be a consistent beacon of light all the time so that when somebody sees you, that can, your life can guide their life into that safe harbor. To be a real wilderness lighthouse. Because you never know who's watching and you never know when they're watching. You don't ever know who sees you and when they're seeing you. And that's what will inspire people. When they see somebody that stands, they will too. Sometimes it only takes one. It only took one Rosa Parks on a bus. That's all it took. One Rosa Parks. That's all it took. All it took. Bring up that picture I asked you for, John Thomas. Everybody remembers what this picture is? Y'all remember that? You remember anybody else except that guy from all that? You know why? Because he stood for that's what, Tiananmen Square. That's when the China, the China was cracking down on all the college students. There's one young man standing in front of four tanks. Because he stood for what he, that picture right there, that lives in my memory until I die. <laughs> that one person that stood for, for what they believed in, for they believe, I remember that picture, I'll remember that picture to the day I die. But I won't remember none of the other pictures on that, but I remember that. I remember Rosa Parks, I don't remember anybody else that went to the back of the bus or wherever they were supposed to, to sit on, but I remember Rosa. <laughs> because that's what inspires people. 
The people that sit off in the side and cower, that's not what inspires people. When you decide, I'm going to stand, I'm not going to change. I'm going to stand for what I believe in. Whether I'm going to stand for God. I'm going to stand for truth. Those are the pictures that live forever in people's mind. That when no matter if you got tanks or storms or the enemy or depression or whatever else is coming against you, that I'm still standing. I don't care what's coming against me. I'm still standing still. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at me because that's what people remember. They don't remember the people that back down and run, run away. Because they gave himself, and these people gave themselves for what they believed in. Daniel didn't fall in line with what the king wanted. He didn't follow all the other young people that were carried away from, Ju from Judah. He walked the straight, and he walked in there, and God blessed him. But more importantly, it was the fact that the other people followed him, the other three. And the, uh, the other three were inspired so much that the next time we see them in the, in the book of Daniel... They're still standing, but this time they're standing on their own, and Daniel's not there to be found. They saw the life that Daniel lived, the sacrifice for God that he had made, and you know what? It made a difference in their lives. When the call came for the king, for everybody to bow down to the king's golden image, they refused to bend. Instead of standing for what they believed in in front of the entire nation this time, they stood out in front of everybody. And when they were called before the king to explain their actions, they didn't fear the king. Here was these three young men, all of a sudden inspired by Daniel. Here's the king saying, I'm going to burn you in the furnace if you don't do it. And they get up to him, and they ain't a bit afraid of him. They ain't the first bit, just like that young man in front of that, those tanks. Wasn't the first bit, there was no fear of him. Instead, they feared God, and they trusted God because they had seen what standing for God had done. The king told them, he said, guys, listen, if you're not going to bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And then he put a challenge to him. He said, and who's God? Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? <laughs> Who is that God? Who, what, God is, what God is going to deliver you? What God is going to deliver you from depression? What God is going to deliver you from alcoholism? What God is going to deliver you from whatever else is going on in your life? What God is, or what, that's what the devil does to you. He sits there on your mind, what God is going to deliver you from the things that's going on in your life? Because you know it, and I don't, but the devil knows it, but God does too. Daniel 3, 16 and 18, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego answered and said, Old Nebuchadnezzar, we ain't careful. We ain't even thinking about our answer. Because we have already said in our minds, we've already decided in our lives, we're not going to even be careful. We don't even have to think about our answer. You've given, us, you've given us a challenge, and we don't even have to think of it. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from, out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. We are not going to bend. We're not going to bow. We're not going to worship. The golden image by which thou hast, what thou hast set up. No matter what you can, king, it don't matter if you told us you were going to cut our toes off one at a time. I ain't changing. It doesn't matter if you told us you're going to clip our fingers off one inch at a time until you get rid of them all. We're not going to change. We're here to stay, king. I'm not bending. I'm not, I am not going to defile myself. They didn't care about their lives. They didn't care about their bodies. All they cared about was serving God. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow. The old Statler Brothers song, y'all remember that? They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. I guess nobody remembers that one. I'm starting to, I'm dating myself now. And, and now half of these people are going like Statler Brothers. Who in the world is that? The king got so mad when he heard this and said that he heated the furnace seven times hotter. And you know the story. The people that went to take them to throw them into the furnace, what happened to them? They burn up. But what happened to the three? They had somebody standing inside that furnace with them, and it wasn't Daniel this time. <laughs> it was God himself. When you stand, you're really never standing alone. <laughs> That's the thing that we know, that no matter what happens in our life, as long as I'm standing for God, as long as I've been repented, I've been baptized in Jesus' name, as long as I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm, I'm not alone. I'm never alone in all this thing. You may feel like you're alone, but all you have to do is... Think on God. Remember God. Remember the things that God has brought us through. God, all the things that God has promised us. 
And he will stand there, and he will comfort you and bless you in your standing. And because the three stood, they showed the king who that God was that could deliver. (laughs) They showed that king who that God was that could deliver out of his hand. And they saw, he saw. The Bible doesn't, this is really, that's what I'm really interested when I was reading this. He said, hey, how many people did we throw in there? Didn't we throw three? And they said, yeah, we threw three. He said, I see. I see. Didn't, see any, didn't say anybody else saw. Everybody else said, King, you're crazy. What are you? He said, I saw one. Didn't you all see it? Didn't you see the fourth? I, we don't know what you're talking about. But God showed him. God showed the man that put the challenge down. Here's who it is. Here, 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 here's the one. You lay a challenge to God. Don't lay a challenge to God. Oh, man. He showed the one that laid the challenge down. It made him look like a fool when he's sitting there saying, where's it? There's, there's a fourth one in there. No, he saw it. But because they stood and they believed in God, it caused him to have a change of heart too. Daniel 3, 28 through 29. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies. They yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own. They yielded, they turned over, they gave up their very bodies so that they would not serve any other God except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, language will speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be in hill because there is no other God that can deliver this way. There ain't no other God that can do what this God just done. I seen him. I seen him in the furnace. I saw what he was able to do. That's how these three, because they stood, they inspired... They made a believer out of King Nebuchadnezzar. Right then and there. They may have, he may have heard about God, but they showed him God. They proved what is that reasonable. That, oh, man. God delivered his servants that trusted him and yielded their bodies up, to his, up for his service. They didn't just give their hearts to God. They didn't just give their minds to God. They give their whole entire body, everything that there was about them. They were that living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. through. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Not a dead sacrifice. Not a sacrifice. Not half. Not I pre- present your hands or your fingers or, or your mind or your mouth. No, he said, present everything that's about you to God as a living ex- uh, sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is just the bare minimum, which is just your reasonable ser- your service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove, so that you can uh, show these people, so you can show King Nebuchadnezzar what is that good, what is that acceptable, and what is that perfect will of God. You can show the whole world. You can show everybody that you work with, you go to school with, everybody that's around you. You can show to them. Daniel determined that he wouldn't defile his body, but instead he would set aside, set himself aside for God's purpose, and God nourished him and gave him favor, and he inspired others. The three Hebrew young men They determined they weren't going to bow down to the king's image. They would not give their bodies up to the worship of another god, but instead remain dedicated to God and to his service. The one and only true God. And God protected them and brought them through the fire, and they inspired a king. Changed the king's mind. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy. He never promised that the hill would 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 not be hard to climb. He never offered our victories without fighting, but he said that help would always come right on time. If you'll stand. If you'll stand, if you'll just hold on, if you'll just remain faithful and present yourself as that living sacrifice to him. Don't conform to the world, but be, tr- but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you give yourself to God, when you bring your body unto subjection to the Lord and you give it to God for his purpose, then that's when you really renewed your mind. That's when you're able to bring your body into subjection. You're saying, body, you're not doing this. You're not going to do this. Then you have renewed your mind. You have conquered yourself, and you've done what Christ was able to do because he was down in the garden, and he said, God, Father, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but done be done. Because he didn't want it, that body part of him, that flesh, didn't want to do what it was. And there's a lot of times this body that Dwayne has don't want to do the things that God wants him to do. But I got to say, God, nevertheless, not my will. I got to give him my body and say, God, I don't want to. I, I want to get Brother Clarence, the guy jumps up in your face and you want to. Mm-hmm. But God said, no, 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 no. Not my will, Lord. You gave your body as a living sacrifice then, Brother Clarence, because you're, you've renewed your mind, haven't you? Your mind has been changed. Think of those people in the Bible that were never able to conquer their wills and their bodies. Adam and Eve wanted to be equal with God, they thought, in their minds. They ate the fruit, brought sin into all men. Cain lost his temper. What did he do? He committed murder. Esau needed that morsel of meat. Wasn't able just to fast for just a little bit. He had to have that morsel of meat, and he ended up losing his birthright. Birthright. Israel had manna. <laughs> had manna every morning. Every morning they waked up and just went outside and got the food for the whole day. Brother Jonathan talking about complaining. <laughs> Wouldn't y'all like to be able to, the wives and has to cook, or, or even the guys, there's guys that cook too. Wouldn't you like to be able to go outside on the porch every morning and there was food for the whole day and you just brought it in and said, we're eating? Wouldn't you just love to be able, and they wasn't satisfied with that. And because of that, God, they, they, they didn't have to work for the food. And because of that, God smote them and a bunch of them killed, died. Samson had to have Delilah, didn't he? Ended up losing his eyes, losing his, losing his life. Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality. On another occasion, you had the entire tribe of Benjamin. Almost the entire tribe of Benjamin got killed. God destroyed everyone because of homosexuality. And what is that? That's not being able to control your, 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 your mental facility. Allowing the body to do whatever it wants to rather than reining some things into control. David had to have Bathsheba, didn't he? Had to have Bathsheba. And what did he do? Committed murder. And the child ended up dying. And we can go on and on and on throughout the Bible. And each time somebody didn't bring themselves under subjection to God, bring their bodies under subjection, rein in their will, there was some kind of a loss. But every time somebody gave of themselves to the Lord, sometime, every time when somebody gave their entire lives to God and his servant, there was some kind of a great gain. Noah gave 100 years to build an ark. A hundred years of, man, we complain because we got to come to church three, now. we got to come longer. Oh, oh, oh. Noah gave a hundred years of, of his life to build a boat, and he saved his family, but he saved all mankind too. Abraham was willing to give his only son. God made a great nation out of him, blessing him every, everything he did. God actually said, in your blessings, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. The things I bless you, I'm going to bless them. I know I gave you 10, but I'm going to take that 10 and make it 100. I'm going to take that 100 and make it 1,000. Joseph allowed God to sell him into slavery, threw him into jail, but he became the number two man in Egypt. And not only did he nourish his whole family, but he, nourished, he was able to help nourish all of Egypt. Rahab submitted herself to the invaders of, of uh, Israel. She risked her life to save hers, and it did what? Saved her family because she gave of herself to God. Ruth gave of her life to follow her mother-in-law. God provided her husband, and she became of the lineage of David and Jesus. Esther risked her life to save the Hebrews. She said she, she, there was a time, there was a purpose, there was a reason for her to be there. And she, she's done that to show that she would spare the lives, and she had the victory, and she sacrificed her, gave her life as a living sacrifice, risked her life, all because they gave themselves, and there was all... Every time there was some kind of a great gain. They didn't worry about their lives. They didn't worry about their Bible. And because they did this, it changed others. And it inspired others. And it gave them that favor with God and with man. Because I want favor with man, but I'd much rather have favor with God. And if I got favor with God, I'll give favor with man no matter where it's at or whatever I need it to be. When Daniel's, in, when Daniel's enemies tried to find something against him, the only thing that they could find was in his dedication to God. It's the only thing that they could ever peg him on. They, could, they tried to devise some kind of a plan to get him in trouble with the king. But the only thing they could do was in his dedication to God. There was nothing. They talked the king into saying, Hey, king, won't you write this decree so that when somebody, you know, nobody can ask anything of you, not even of another person or another. Now, imagine the pastor writes this decree. For the next 30 days, y'all can't ask each other no questions. You can't go to ask your boss a question. You can't ask nobody a question. You've got to all bring it to the pastor. You wouldn't do that, would you, Pastor? <laughs> he don't want that on him. 
Pastor, what should I do about this problem at work? That's what the king was doing. Now, think about how prideful that was when he wrote that. They asked him to write that decree. He said, anybody that asks of anybody else, you're going into the lion's den. And they knew that Daniel had gave himself to prayer three times a day. And he understood when that was written, he knew what was going to happen. The Bible said that when he knew the writing was signed, when he knew it was signed on the dotted line, he went home. (laughs) And he might not have ever done it before. But he opened the windows because he wanted the whole world to see, I'm, 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 I'm not defiling myself. I don't care about what that king says. I don't care what the world says. I'm gonna get, he opened up the window so that those guys and the whole world, he knew the moment that they saw him do what he was getting ready to do, that he went to the lion's den. But he wasn't a big part of it because he had given his life over to God completely holy. He had given over to God and he said, I'm going to pray my three times a day. I don't care what they say because I am not going to be I'm not going to break. They're not going to do anything to get me to change about what I feel about God. They grabbed him. They brought him to the king. And the king was so upset because he allowed himself to get tricked into signing this because of this, this prideful decree. Now he had to put Daniel in the lion's den. The, king stayed, the Bible says that the king stayed awake all night long. And you know what else he did? What did he do, Mom? He had allowed pride to creep into his life. To sign this decree, you can only ask me because I'm the king. And because he had done it, I'm bringing my body in subjection. My buddy Daniel is in the lion's den because of me, because of something foolish that I've done. And I like Daniel. And he's in the lion's den because of that. You know what? I'm going to fast. I'm going to stay awake all night long. And I'm going to fast. I'm going to bring this body under subjection. And just so helping, just maybe I might be able to change something. And the king stayed awake. And when he got up the next morning, he went to the door. Daniel 6, 20 through 23 says, And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, <laughs> is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? And the Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. O king, live forever. My God. My God has sent an angel and has shut the lion's mouth. And they have not hurt me in for much. Before him, before him, innocency was found in me because I stood for what was right. I stood for what God wanted. And for you, king, I, and also before thee, king, I have no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad and commanded that he should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No matter hurt was found upon him because he, why? Because he believed in God. He may have been in the den with a bunch of hungry lions, but, he, but just like his f- friends in the furnace, he had somebody else. He had the Lion of Judah in there with him. He had the Lion of Judah clamping them mouths of those lions. If a lion went up to go sniff at him, God like, no, 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 no. He might went up to Daniel and said, man, look at that juicy leg. And the guy said, no, 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 smacked him in the back of the head. No, lion, you get away. Because God was right there with him the whole time. And if you'll stand for God, God will stand with you. you God, doesn't, he, God gave his life, and all he asks us to do is give our life right back to him. And old King Judas, old King Darius, I'm sorry, became a true believer. All beca- that day, all because Daniel wouldn't submit, he would not submit to another, but instead believed God. And the pastor preached it last week, or the last week, last time he was here during his message, and Jonathan referenced that as well. Some things only come by giving, by sacrificing your body, by fasting, and by prayer. The, by, the pastor said you can't what? It can't fast. He said that. He said, I can pray all the time, but it's hard to fast, ain't it? I can fast. It don't bother me to fast. I can do 24 hours. That ain't no big deal. I can give two hours, three hours. Brenda knows. I get up in the morning. I can give two, three hours a morning. Studying for messages my whole week. I mean, I'm 6 o'clock till 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock. What? I'm, I'm up studying messages. I can do that. It's hard for me to pray. It's really hard for me to, set, to keep my mind on track to pray. It's really hard for me to set the time aside. Preaching on Dwayne. Going to just tell you what Dwayne's problems are. I'll tell you. I don't mind. It don't bother me to tell you. It's nobody's fault but my own. I'm preaching to all of us so today. Because we've got parts in our lives that we have. We can't turn over to God. That we want to take for ourselves. Whatever it's what we watch, watch, talk, listen to, whatever. We don't want to turn it over to God because that's ours. We, that's mine, God. I, 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 we, 
then don't 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 then you evidently don't want real favor with God. You don't want God to really, really, truly, truly bless you and you to be that inspiration and to make that change in other people's lives that you have the ability to. The musicians, if they would come, I'm closing. Some things only come by fasting and prayer. There are some things that only come when you give your life over as a living sacrifice. There's some things that only that you can tap into God when you, only because that you give your life wholly, completely over to God, given to Him, bringing yourself into subjection under the will of God. If God moved, I'm going to challenge, I'll lay the challenge down to the church. If God moved in the lives of these people we talked about, of those people that dedicated themselves to God, which, again, was just simply their reasonable service. They became that living sacrifice. What would happen if I did? What would have happen if I just turned the television off every night and I went and prayed and I fasted and I studied? And instead of going and doing the things that I wanted to do, I gave that time to God. What would happen to Dwayne and to his family and to his friends and the people, what would happen to him? What would God do for him? What would happen if part of the church did it? What if 10, 20, 40, 65? What if 65 of us decided we're going to dedicate our lives to God? Not just our mouths, not just our tongues when we're in here speaking in tongues or whatever else. Our, t our stomachs, our time, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we act. Our attitudes, we're just going to give it all to God. What would God do if the power of God, what would he do if we gave of ourselves completely? Now, I'm not saying that we got to live in the prayer closet for 24 hours a day and we got to be down at the church all the time. But what I'm saying is that we're not going to conform to what the world wants, to what the world tries to press upon us. Not allowing the pressure to get to us and to make us change. It means bringing your entire lives and your body into subjection unto the will of God and to what God really wants. A constant state of readiness so that no matter what the world or the enemy throws at us, I'm saying, my first, very, my very, we're not careful in what we answer to you, world. I'm not bending. I'm not bowing. You ain't making me change, world. God has given us, think about this, God has given us this opportunity to tap into that kind of a blessing from God. And Brother Jonathan, what was you saying, Brother Jonathan? We just, we just let it go, whatever. The, the things that we have at us, you was talking about. Um, no, actually, you said you tapped into the, the stuff the pastor allows you to tap into. That's right. Uh, the inheritance. You was talking about the inheritance, yeah. He taps into those pretty regularly, I think. <laughs> On a regular, consistent basis. <laughs> but what if, we had, what if we tapped into these things from God? That we just wasn't, that, you know, everything that we did was about God. Everything that we did, and I'm not talking about fanatics. I'm not talking about occults and stuff like that. I'm just talking about every day we live our lives as if, God, I want to inspire somebody else. God, I want to make a change, not just for me, because my life's already changed. My mind, I'm not transforming. I've already had my mind renewed. I'm where God wants me to be. I'm not saying I am. I'm saying if I did that. But I'm saying if I live my life through that, what would God do for a group of believers that did that, that came together. If it was just 10 of us, if it was just 20 of us, whatever it might be, if it was just one of us, I'm going to prove, I'm going to test what will happen if I have that good will of God in my life, the acceptable will of God in my life, the perfect will, because Dwayne don't have that, okay? Y'all might be feeling bad, but remember, who, who, gets to write the, who gets to read these notes first? This hits me way before. This started hitting me early in the week. I, I got to think on this whole message all week long. Y'all ain't had to. Because I've had to say, oh, Dwayne, you're going to say this and you're not even close to that? You're not even close, Dwayne? You're not doing this? But I know within my heart that if I did, that if I could come to what God is asking us to do. He's done told it to us twice this morning. He had Jonathan talk about it, and he's had me talk about it. There must be something that God's wanting us to do. Yeah. Must be something that God wants us to do as a body of believers, as a group of people that comes together. And we'll find out just what the some things only come through fasting and prayer. Do you want to find out what those things are? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to be able to find God, what are those things? Is it healing? God, is it to prick the hearts of my family? 
Is it to is it to is it to get me stronger to be able to be able to speak to people at work and do whatever it takes to reach out to people? God, what are those things that only come with fasting and prayer? Do you want to find those out? And if we do, whatever it might be, we'll only do it when we become that living sacrifice. When I give my body, again, I'm not talking about 24 hours a day at the church and in the prayer closet. I'm just saying, living with your mind made up that I am not changing. I am not bound, backing down. I'm not going to bow. And this morning, it's afternoon. It's not, yeah, it's afternoon. This afternoon, if you want to make a difference, you don't have to pray here at the altar. Do it at your, at, at your bench there. But get down and say, God, give me the ability. God, help me to stand. The pastor comes up here. You guys get ready to sing. God, give me that ability, God, that so no matter what happens, that I have that ability to be able to stand with the things that, that, that God wants. That I've given my life over to his will, and I'll stand for the things that I believe in. Pastor.